Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Um, hello. Okay, let me just admit these people. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual launch of WeConnect. My name is Dasnuba Sinha. I'm the Initiative Communication Manager at WeDefine at WeConnect. It's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. Uh, before we dive in, I would like to take a few moments while we wait for others to join and invite you all to take a little bit of fun icebreaker that we have. Uh, you should be able to see uh, uh, all on your screen, so feel free to write your answers over there. It's um, that is uh, um, that is where are you joining us from, and what expectations do you have of today's event? Feel free to drop your answers. Wonderful. I think we will take another two three minutes and then start with our main agenda. All right, we have 15 people answered the question, where are you from? And we have a lot of people also answered, what expectations do you have from today's event? Awesome. So let's just wait another two minutes. And while we wait for others to join, we are expecting quite a number of people today. And then we will start on, move on with our today's agenda. Whoa, we have nine, 20 people answered. Where are you from now? Awesome. Let's just wait another one or two minutes and we can start at just at 9.05 Bangladesh time. All right, I think uh, we will start right now. Uh, we will start today with our we will start today with our presentation of the white paper, followed by the Q and A session. Presenting the white paper and leading the discussion, we uh, will be Dr. Sheikh Tawhidul Haq, Assistant Professor and Research Fellow at Bragg Institute of Governance and Development. Dr. Hawke's expertise in economics and his dedication to impactful research are sure to make this session engaging. Let's welcome Dr. Hawke. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Sheikh Tohidul Hawke, a research fellow uh, at BIGD. I'm presenting a white paper that is meticulously crafted around a conceptual framework designed to shape and guide the future research agenda focusing on digital connectivity and its pivotal role in advancing women's economic empowerment. Let me share the... Sorry. 
So <clears throat> let me lay out the context. The digital technology marks a significant transformation in speed, scale, and scope in the second half of the 20th century. While the digital technology revolution has had far-reaching consequences, low- and middle-income countries in many ways had the most gain, given historically underdeveloped information system, communication infrastructure, and public services. With, within LMSs, the ICT revolution is especially beneficial for women given the foundation social constraint they face, including limited mobility, information asymmetry, social isolation, and lower level literacy that hinder their access to what services are available in economic, social, and political arena. In this white paper, we particularly focus on the impact of digital connectivity. Then what is digital connectivity? This is the ability on individual access, and if effectively use mobile and internet able devices to search information, communication in real time over long distances, and access of digitized network system platform and services provided by government, non-government organization, private companies, and local communities. Now, this figure, this image highlights several key issues related to digital connectivity and access to the access in the context of global disparities. So regarding infrastructure, in the data says, in the least developed, developed countries, almost one in six people live outside the coverage area of mobile broadband, indicating significant gaps in digital infrastructure. Globally, 38% of population does not own a phone. And of the 28% who do own a smartphone, only 14% of women showcasing a gender disparity in digital access. Affordability is a major issue here, with a local smartphone costing an average of 41% of monthly income, and the feature phone costing about 16%. Additionally, 2 GB of data cost an average of $8.5, adjusted for purchasing power parity, which is significant for individual in the global south. So regarding the digital content, the language barrier is evident as more than 50% of internet sites are in English, but only about 30% of global population speak English, limiting the accessibility of online content for non-English speakers. Chance of impact. So what in this slide we, we highlight, what are the chance of impact of digital connectivity and women empowerment? Here we delineate some of the key channels through which digital connectivity is driving economic changes in the LMIC. Building on the Goldfarb and Tucker 2019, who argue that transformative potential of digitization stems from its impact on lowering fundamental economic costs. In this white paper, we focus on those pathways most likely affected by connectivity, mainly low it lowers information communication cost and increased accessibility of services. These are by no means the only mechanism, but we focus on them because they are likely to be especially consequential for loosening the foundation constraints that affect women's economic empowerment in emerging economies. Let me talk about more on these issues. So information cost, digital connectivity reduces information cost by transforming traditional barriers and inefficiencies in enhanced efficiency and accessibility of information. Digital connectivity reduces communication cost by reducing the cost of long distance communication, improve market coordination, increase economic integration and foster social connectivity. It also increases the access to services by reducing cost and enable in innovative solution like mobile money and digital education. Now, the, what are the impacts of digital connectivity for women? So we'll discuss the impact in three levels. The, the, the first are impacts at the individual household level, then impact at the market level, and impact at the level of the economy and society. So at the individual level, so we expect commercially driven digital connectivity will drive substantial productivity and welfare gains for women and men in LMIC, especially low-income communities. When we talk about the impact at the market level, we expect use of meaningful connectivity 
can encourage improvement in the design of existing commercial, public, social service and provision of new services. It solves market failure and enable market efficiencies by providing positive demand shock and reduce the marginal cost of service provision. Beyond its individual and household level impact and market level effects, expanding connectivity for women may also impact economy and society. Like expanding women's connectivity can increase the marginal benefit of investing in public good and private good that have positive externalities. It also promotes women political agency and influence social norms about gender. Then here, we actually explain the framework of women's connectivity and development. This diagram is very important for this white paper. This diagram illustrates a conceptual framework for understanding how digital connectivity can influence women's economic empowerment. It contains the situation of women without connectivity who are facing barriers like affordability, accessibility, literacy, relevance, safety, security, and norms compared to those who have internet access. Connectivity can help women overcome mobility restriction, literacy gap, social isolation, providing job market and, uh, job and market information, enhancing safety, and challenging discrimination, discriminatory norms. As more women use phone, it drives ecosystem development, including digital health, education technology, and digital finance. This, in turn, creates a critical mass of connected users and services, which further drive adoption. The framework suggests that initial outcome like increased labor force participation, entrepreneurial productivity, led to long-term development outcomes like increased consumption, reduced poverty, greater health, psychosocial well-being, and ultimately enhance overall socioeconomic status. Now, the next slide, we actually explain what are the barriers of digital connectivity adoption? In the last slide, I have already, already, already shows the barriers. So let me highlight those. So here, the afford affordability, first one, the, the major barriers is affordability. The affordability represents the cost of a smartphone and mobile data plans relative to consumer income, which affects elasticity of demand. Affordability issues significantly impact smartphone and mobile data access in LMIC where cost is high relative to income, particularly affecting the poorest population and widening digital gender gap. When you talk about the availability and accessibility, so it shows on the supply side, network coverage in low-income countries facing challenges from high maintenance cost, low consumer purchasing power, which often resulting in limited rural 3G and 4G coverage that disproportionately affect women due to gender urban migration pattern. Then digital literacy and relevance. So literacy is one of the important barrier of which actually hinder the adoption rate, limit the adoption rate. Here the digital literacy and digital literacy profoundly impact digital connectivity. So according to the, the Stainfield 2016, literacy and digital literacy are different. According to them, literacy means the ability to read, write, and understand digital text in numbers, whereas the digital literacy means able to ability to navigate, understand, and use information communication technologies and internet. So relevance means lack of digital content in the local, con local context. So the lack of digital content of, in local language also reduces the relevance of connectivity for women. So when you talk about the network effect, so it shows the wider adoption rate of mobile phone connectivity demonstrates substantial social and commercial benefits of positive network effect because digital connectivity represents a classical network good where its value increase as more people adopt the technology. So lastly, the norms, it means the influence of social and cultural factors is a final and overarching dimension, dimension mediating the digital connectivity. These norms, which vary across society, can restrict women's communication with men, not only in the family, but also their limit their physical mobility, dictate their educational and work opportunities, and censor their access to content. 
So social norms also exacerbate gender disparity in digital connectivity by restricting women access and opportunity in various ways. So, so oh, I'm extremely sorry. So yeah, so in this, in this uh, slide, I, I show the, 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 there's an endogeneity and simultaneity of cause and consequences of this, what is it, analysis. So that means holding, so we should acknowledge that the consequence may themselves become causes in expanding women's connectivity. How? The new adoption of phones and internet and the general expansion of demand is endogenous to dynamic evolution of preferences. The fast changing shape of the supply curve, also the expanding production possibility frontiers. That is why it is imperative to, 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 it, uh, to simplify the theories which need, which need to propose, who, uh, that is, I mean, a simplified theories or framework need to be proposed to address these uh, endogeneity issues and complexity of relationship. When you talk about the, the, what is it called, the evidence, according to the literature, the evidence suggests a highly positive impact of labor force participation and income generation, as well as greater access and control over financial resources on gender inclusion. While improvement in agriculture productivity, access to education, access to healthcare, governance and public service show generally positive effect. However, there is limited evidence on the differential impact by gender. When you talked about the market and general, general equilibrium effect, it is observed that these effects are sector specific that contribute to broader social societal benefit, including poverty reduction and increased consumption. Finally, we propose the some of the research question organized around conceptual framework, which I introduced before, uh, to guide a future research agenda on connectivity and women economic empowerment. Our framework categorized prospective research question, which include a focus on the general welfare benefit of connectivity and the challenges in measuring digital connectivity among women, as well as examining in various barriers on the adoption of digital connectivity. So in this framework, in this framework, we don't want to know what the what is the effect of. Rather, we want to know the mechanism, how to answer the question how. So some of the questions of future research question are in the general uh, uh, welfare benefit category. What are the expected human development impact of reducing barrier to meaningful connectivity for new and existing women user? So regarding the measurement issue. It should be what are the trends and gender gaps in meaningful connectivity and its key enablers. When you talked about the barriers, the, the prospective research question on affordability, accessibility, and delivery should be how does affordability constant women's meaningful connectivity and what intervention could sustainably improve affordability at scale? So, where do women have limited accessibility to phones and internet, and what intervention could certainly improve women's access. When you talk about the relevancy, the prospective fu future question should be, how can we identify enable access to promote the creation of relevant content, service and use cases of phone and internet for women? Finally, the digital literacy question should be, what are the impactful scale scalable and cost-effective digital literacy intervention that work across different segment of women? So what are the nature and impact of technology facilitated gender-based violence experienced by women? What are the mechanism for prevention and redress? And final, norms barrier. How do social norms constraint, constraint women's meaningful connectivity? And how can intervention overcome, the, overcome and change norms? I encourage all of you to read this white paper to get more insight on this issue. So, so this is the question and answer session. If you have any question, please feel free on this white paper, feel free to ask me. If you have any question on RFP, our next presenter, Kim, will address those questions, please. So floor is open.
So if you have any question, please feel free to ask me. I have a question. Yes. Um, so are you, um, are, is, um, is the part of the grant objectives, are you looking for bundles or are you interested primarily on like um, tackling one of the items, focusing on one of the items rather than, um, than a bundle that tackles multiple items? Thank you very much for your question. But in our next, this is a actually a question regarding the, our uh, RFP. Our next presenter, Kim, will address these questions. Thank you. Thank you. So please feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, I don't think we have any questions, so we will move on. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you. For Thank you very much. I encourage all of you, please read this white paper to get more insight on, on the issue of digital connectivity and women economic empowerment. So since there is no question, I am actually handing over the microphone to, to our Tasnuva. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hawk, for that enlightening presentation and discussion. Just to answer the question that's on the chat, we will be sharing the recording of the session and the white paper, um, the first version of it has been uploaded in the website. We will also be emailing to all the participants here uh, with, the, uh, with the link of the uh, white paper. We have now with us Dr. Imran Mathin, um, who, who serves as the Executive Director of Brack Institute of Governance and Development. With a profound dedication to advancing research on policy and development interventions, Dr. Mathin has been instrumental in positioning BIGD as a globally rec recognized center for rigorous research. Uh, please welcome Dr. Imran Mateen. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm not turning my video on simply because I'm actually in an environment of low connectivity. I'm out in the field uh, in Shakira, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in one of the districts of, of Bangladesh. So uh, I won't turn the video on, but I hope I'm audible. Great, thank you. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is, is, is essentially two things. I say a few words about BIGD uh, and try and connect that to this research initiative that, uh, that we, have, we, have, we, we have started and we are sort of launching today. Uh, yeah. So, so firstly, you know, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, you know, BIGD, I mean, is a, is a research and a postgraduate teaching institute of, of Brack University. Uh, and it's, it's, it's based in based in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, we we like to basically think ourselves uh, to be to be an institution, knowledge institution that is dedicated to the whole idea of knowledge for development. Uh, and within that, we are particularly interested in uh, in in policy interventions that improve development and governance outcomes for the majority. Uh, and even at a you know, more detailed level, we are primarily interested in, in, in rigorous research that generates evidence and insights uh, to, uh, to, to really have a better understanding of key constraints that, uh, uh, that need to be addressed to improve Development and governance outcomes, but more importantly, we are interested in solutions that can be scaled. Uh, so, 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 so that's really uh, at the at the at the heart of what 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 BIGD does. Um, uh, uh, so, so we connect is as you have just heard from the presentation made in the white paper. Uh, is sort of very much, uh, I think, related to to this overall uh, trust uh, around which BIGD, uh, you know, is sort of uh, works. Uh, 
in my in my mind, I mean, we connect is primarily about uh, 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 fostering and making Rio a, a more inclusive digital society, uh, uh, particularly to ensure that those who uh, uh, can benefit hugely but are not being able to benefit uh, given the uh, uh, the rules of the game, the way things are, as things are, uh, uh, this particular research program is really addressed to answer some of those constraints to be able to come up with uh, solutions to which uh, uh, you know, we can make greater progress towards the inclusive digital society. Um, especially in the context of gender, uh, I think it's extremely clear that uh, uh, digital, uh, uh, the, the digital connectivity uh, uh, is, 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 uh, is layered on existing structural gender in, uh, 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 inequities. Uh, and, and, and unless we really understand the power asymmetry and the power inequities, which, which interplay with the information inequity, uh, uh, we'll not be able to really address the, the broader constraints that we are trying to basically uh, sort of address. So, so I think that's what we connect research and you know, is, is really basically trying to do, uh, uh, you know, trying to bring, uh, bring, bring you know, the light of rigorous uh, evidence and research uh, uh, to sort of uh, uh, not only look at uh, you know the what, uh, uh, but but much more importantly, uh, how because ultimately we 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 want to be able to be able to design uh, solutions or influence the design of solutions and policies to be able to address uh, the critical constraints that have been identified in the in the white paper with that just. Uh, we connect is is is, uh, is 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 sort of therefore is extremely exciting. It's a new research initiative of BIGD, and 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 we're really really excited to to sort of uh, 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 you know kind of uh, direct this 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 new research initiative and sort of generate the kind of evidence globally to be able to uh, uh, address some of the some of, some of the constraints that basically will give rise to this asymmetry that we or the gender gap that we currently see. Uh, in terms of the objective, I think uh, uh, we connect is uh, is is, is you know, I think is clear. So it's a it's a dedicated funding opportunity to sort of generate rigorous research on the issue of women's digital connectivity, uh, with a focus in the global south. So this is a global uh, 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 research fund. So we will be supporting research across the world. Uh, the idea is also to create a knowledge hub on digital connectivity and gender, so that. You know, this this sort of the research, uh, you know, not only finishes after this this fund is over, but we can actually turn this into a knowledge hub uh, uh, to be able to influence and impact uh, uh, policy and thinking, and intervention design. Uh, we also want to create a scholarly community of practice for researchers exploring this intersectionality of digital connectivity and gender. And, and, and we saw that the evidence base here is extremely weak, and that's exactly why we want to, we want to, we want to really, you know, kind of very excited to work in this, in this whole area. And, and finally, you know, there's this body of evidence uh, that would be generated by this program. Uh, the, the, the idea is that, is, is that we provide donors and practitioners and policymakers with, with evidence-based insights uh, to reduce the gender gap uh, in, in in access to meaningful connectivity, and 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 we will be working. Uh, I mean, not only with respect to the to the research funding, but also to try and you know work with you to basically uh, help the policy uptake uh, uh, of these of these research research findings as as well. So uh, so so I think that that provides you with a with a with a bit bit more you know kind of uh, you know uh, uh, connection to. Uh, how the WeConnect research initiative aligns with the overall objective uh, of BIGD as a knowledge institution. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I will look forward to you know kind of uh, uh, staying tuned and 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 look I mean, and, and and listen in. But 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 also I look forward to you know great uh, uh, research proposals that will be coming 
uh, and 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 working with all of you in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mateen, for those in insightful remarks. Now it's time for an important segment of our event: the release of the um, the release of the RFP, followed by the Q and A session. Taking us through the session is Ms. Kim Cole, Initiative Director of We Define and We Connect. Kim brings a wealth of experience and passion for driving impactful change in the realm of women's economic empowerment. Please, well, please join me in welcoming Kim Cole to guide us through this important part of the event. Thank you so much, Chasnimba. I will pull my presentation up. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, or evening, or afternoon, depending on where you are today. Um, my name is Kim Cole. I'm the director of both the We Define and We Connect initiatives at BIGD, and we're really excited to be launching our new initiative today. So we've already heard a bit of background from uh, both Imran Bai and Tohid Bai on what We Connect is, but I'll be diving into a little bit more detail of the objectives of our newest initiative. So as we mentioned, WeConnect aims to generate a comprehensive body of evidence regarding women's access to digital information. And as Tohid Bai mentioned in his presentation, despite the prevalence of digital technology, there's actually very limited rigorous research examining the impacts of these technology, particularly on women. So specifically, WeConnect will finance rigorous research that investigates the intersection of digital con connectivity and women's economic empowerment. Additionally, as Imran Bai mentioned, WeConnect seeks to establish a scholarly community of practice on these topics, which to our knowledge doesn't yet exist to date. Now, if you're familiar with BIGD and our work, you have probably heard of the We Define initiative, which has been operating for about three and a half years. The We Connect, initi uh, we Connect initiative is very similar to We Define. It's actually a sister but independent initiative. So fortunately, we connect benefits from a lot of the infrastructure already established by We Define, although it is an independent entity. So you will see that there are a lot of similarities between the two initiatives, as well as similarities between our processes and protocols. Also similar to We Define, a key objective of We Connect is to level the competitive playing field for academics that are often excluded from the competitive funding process. This specifically refers to academics from our countries of focus, early career academics, and female academics. And also, similarly to the We Define initiative, We Connect is open to quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method studies based in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. And if you're curious as to what specific countries that refers to, we do have a comprehensive list available on our FAQs document on our website. Now, there are a few components that are new to WeConnect that we haven't yet offered under WeDefine. Uh, the first one I think is perhaps the most evident component, and that's the thematic scope of WeConnect. It's actually much broader than that of WeDefine, which focuses on digital finance and women's economic empowerment. Conversely, WeConnect focuses much more broadly on women's access to digital connectivity. Second, we will be introducing a new deliverable for some of our subboards as relevant. We will be requesting a cost benefit analysis to large scale quantitative studies where this is possible and relevant. Thirdly, we will be introducing some new contractual requirements under our WeConnect awards. And these requirements are elaborated in detail on our RFP document, so please do review those. Uh, but as a summary, under WeConnect, we are going to be prioritizing early research learnings and early dissemination. So these contractual requirements are really geared towards ensuring that we're learning early and disseminating those uh, learnings early. And finally, WeConnect introduces a new grant category for secondary data analysis of existing data sets which I'll share a little bit more about as well. So of course, today we are officially launching our first request for proposals. You will find all of this information uploaded to our website today um, from the RFP document, the white paper, our budget template, etc. And as a summary, um, I mentioned that WeConnect is open to both uh, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method studies. 
and our grant categories are very similar to those available under We Define. Just in case you're new to our uh, initiatives, we have large grants available. Greenfield evaluations are valued at up to $500,000 and extensions to existing studies up to $200,000. We have five different categories under our small grants, including measurement experiments, qualitative studies as either standalone or extension studies, as well as pilot RCTs. And all four, all four of these categories are value, valued at up to $50,000. Our newest category, secondary data analysis, is valued up to $20,000. And as I mentioned, this is primarily to finance uh, analysis of existing data sets. So this category is really geared towards supporting the staff time of researchers. As such, we do expect that the budget for this category will be different than those four studies that are executing primary data collection. Of course, our submission deadline is on April 30th, and that um, our feat closes at 11.59 p.m. Bangladesh Standard Time. Uh, so please do take a look at your um, time zone and make sure to mark the time zone conversion because we will be closing the portal at just one minute before midnight Bangladesh Standard Time. Unfortunately, we're not able to accept late submissions. We also have a number of preferred criteria under this RFP. So these criteria are those that we're stating a strong preference for, but they are not requirements. But some things that we will be looking for in our proposals uh, include team composition. So of course, we are looking for research teams that include an academic from the study's country of focus in a meaningful and robust manner. And we're also looking for teams with gender diversity. Secondarily, we have some preferences for the interventions that our evaluations um, are studying. Firstly, we'll be looking for interventions that have the potential to be scaled up. And secondly, we'll be looking for interventions, particularly with regard to our large grants, that have the potential for cost benefit analysis. So we will be asking in your proposal whether your intervention is able to generate cost data. We're also excited to be sharing a variety of resources to proposal teams this cycle. Many of these we have offered previously under We Define, but we also have some new offerings. So firstly, we are once again bringing our team's office hours. These are informal sessions where teams are encouraged to drop in, ask questions informally, and really just have some time with, with our staff. Um, these are in a group setting. And while you're encouraged to email us questions in advance, you're also welcome to just drop on the, on the line at the specific time uh, and interact with our team. Second, we will once again be offering one-on-one -on -one technical and financial coaching calls, which we offered during our last We Define cycle. However, this time we will be requesting an expression of interest before we book a call with proposal teams. And this is for a few reasons. Uh, firstly, we simply have limited staff time, so we're only able to offer a select number of coaching calls. Second, we want to be able to help teams as much as possible and be as efficient on these calls as we can, so we will be collecting some information on your study in advance. And thirdly, we want to be very targeted in our resources, so we want to ensure that a coaching call is the best fit for a given proposal team at that time. And in the event that a team is not extended a coaching call, we will be directing the team to another resource offered under the We Connect initiative. Next, for the first time, we are excited to bring to you a live proposal development workshop in DACA. And this workshop is geared towards teams that are based in DACA, uh, but is, there's no restriction on who is able to attend. Uh, we will be requesting applications in advance for this workshop as well. Of course, we bring to you a variety of online resources. And if you're familiar with We Define, you've probably seen the many virtual resources that we already have available. If you're new to BIGD, you have two initiatives to review resources for. Um, and the, the resources under We Define are very relevant to WeConnect as well. 
And finally, we will be offering opportunities for feedback on all submitted proposals, irrespective of how far a proposal uh, has, has gone in our reviews process. Now, you may be wondering if you are familiar with BIGD's work, what about we define and the next RFP? We will be launching our fourth RFP under Redefine in exactly two weeks, so stay tuned. So these two RFPs will be simultaneous, but slightly staggered in their timelines. Therefore, these resources will be open to teams interested in submitting a proposal to either initiative. Since We Connect is new, we're also expecting that teams will have questions about which proposal is more relevant for We Define versus We Connect. And we are here to help you with that. So you are more than welcome to use any of these resources if you're interested in either initiative or if you're not sure which one is the better fit for your study. I also have a few pro tips, which are insider information for developing a strong proposal for the We Connect initiative. The first one is to include a strong letter from any implementation partner that you will be collaborating with. And we've stressed this in the past under Redefine, uh, but we are being more specific this time under We Connect. We often see that a lot of delays and miscommunications happen um, at this stage. So we're encouraging communication with any partner early and in specific detail. This becomes especially relevant for any, any randomized evaluations where there is a control group. So please do have early conversations with any implement, uh, implementation partner and clearly delineate the expectations of the research and solidify that in a letter. Second, please do plan to prepare early research learnings and go ahead and signal these in both your timeline and your budget. As I mentioned, early research learnings are a key priority under WeConnect, and we will be looking for teams' um, signal of their intention and commitment to identify learnings early. So go ahead and flag that for us in your proposal. Thirdly, please do consider whether your proposal is a better thematic fit for We Connect or for We Define, because we will only be allowing a given proposal to be submitted to one of these two initiatives. And as I mentioned, you're welcome to speak with our team and we will help you identify which will be the better thematic fit for your study. And finally, please decide early if you'd like to take advantage of our coaching call opportunities. As I mentioned, we will be requesting an expression of interest, and we have a limited number of calls that we're able to offer. So please do uh, start your application early and take advantage of that if you're interested. I will pause there and I will open the floor for any questions. And of course, you are always welcome to reach out to us via email at our institutional account. But for the time being, I will switch over to um, questions from the audience. Please go ahead and drop those in the chat and I will be taking a look. All right. A question from Carolina, is the extension category maxed at what amount? So our extensions to existing studies are maxed out at $200,000. And Betty asks, can we get a copy of this slide to send to colleagues? Yes, you absolutely can. We will be disseminating the slides and we'll also have this recording available for colleagues who weren't able to attend today. Doris asks, how many proposals can a team submit? We do not put any max on the number of proposals that you're able to submit. Um, however, the only restriction here is the same proposal cannot be submitted to both We Define and We Connect. Otherwise, you're welcome to submit as many different proposals as you like. Jimo asks, is uh, our health related studies allowed? Um, the short answer to this is yes. If the health related study is directly related to the scope of work under our initiatives, uh, then yes, there's no reason a health related study could not be submitted. And if you take a look at um, our, our studies already under the We Define initiative, a couple do have health related dimensions. Sarah asks, 
It sounds like you are largely interested in women. Are you also interested in research studies that specifically focus on adolescents and young women? That is a great question. We absolutely are interested in studies that focus on younger women and adolescents. Um, there is no restriction to focus on adult women. You are more than welcome to submit studies that are focused on younger women. Um, the only kind of requirement that we would look at um, would be IRB implications and working with underage populations would be um, a concern that we would want to see expressed in the proposal. Carolina asks, do you have a preference for bundles or tackling specific constraints? That's a great question. Um, we do not have a stated preference for either one. I would say it really depends on your study and the scope of your study. So for smaller studies, for example, a pilot RCT, we would probably want to see uh, specific constraints tackled, whereas a larger study, such as a Greenfield RCT, would probably have scope to tackle a few different constraints. I will flag that we want to see, uh, we want to see studies that have a very clear um, plan to delineate causal mechanisms, and we want to ensure that the studies are actionable and feasible. So um, one kind of, I guess, pro tip is don't be too overambitious in your studies. Try not to study all causal mechanisms in the same proposal because that probably won't um, be the enable the type of precision that we're looking for. I hope that helps, Carolina. Razine asks, can we connect help with matchmaking? For instance, a private sector organization looking to partner with researchers. That's a great question. Um, the short answer is yes. We will do our very best. We don't have a formal mechanism to matchmake at this time, um, but we are always open to speak with teams who are looking to meet others. Um, and we will do our best in an informal capacity as much as we can. Um, Razine, if you're also based in Dhaka, um, I think the proposal development workshop might be a great opportunity to meet like-minded organizations in person. Morgan asks, in terms of eligibility, do the research institutes need to I, need to be either academic or nonprofit, or can research firms that are also small businesses apply? Yes, small businesses can also apply. Um, research institutes do not have to have a specific registration status. And in the past, we have awarded grants to uh, small research firms that are registered as private businesses. So there is no restriction in that regard. Betty asks, can we have PIs from partner countries engage with others from non-country agencies uh, via, via a UK university? Um, I hope I'm understanding the, the question, Betty. Please feel free to clarify if, if I'm not getting it accurately. Um, but yes, you can certainly engage with PIs that are associated with other institutions in other countries. In fact, that's actually what we tend to see on our studies is that teams come together and they represent a variety of institutions and are often based all around the world. Noor asks, just to make sure I understood correctly, organizations are not allowed to submit the same proposal to both We Define and We Connect but we are able to apply in both categories with different proposals. Yes, Noor, that is correct. Great clarification. Let me grab a sip of water. All right. Regina asks, can one submit a proposal connecting GBV and tech abuse? Regina, that is a great question. And that's actually a very specific theme that we call out in our white paper. So yes, we are looking at um, GBV and tech abuse as a specific category of, of possible studies under WeConnect. 
Emmanuel asks, please, can independent researchers or researchers who are affiliated with private, private organizations submit an application? Great question. Um, so we do encourage researchers that are affiliated with private organizations to submit an application as opposed to independent researchers. And this is primarily due to the reporting requirements of our awards. Um, it's going to be quite difficult for an individual researcher to go through our financial due diligence process um, to qualify for one of our awards. So if you have the opportunity to submit independently or through an organization, I definitely recommend the latter. Charles asks, do female PIs have an advantage over a male PI in a, in a research team for any proposal in addition to the gender diversity of the team? Um, that's a great question. So as I mentioned, we do prefer gender diversity on our teams, um, specifically because our research studies are focused on women, um, but there is no disadvantage for teams that are include male PIs necessarily. Um, so we do want to kind of create room and space for female PIs to be included on the research team, but we want this to be in a meaningful and robust capacity. I hope that clarifies. Doris asks, what is the maximum grant for the secondary data proposal category? Um, Doris, the max on that is $20,000. Regina asks, can you make the workshop in DACA blended? Those of us in Africa can attend virtually. Regina, that's a great question. Um, thanks for asking that. And we have considered that. Since this is the very first time that we're offering this, we're going to have this be an in-person model only. However, we are treating this as a sort of a pilot workshop and we're hoping um, that we'll be able to offer more of these in the future at a, in a capacity that is um, scaled uh, and virtual. So um, great question, but this time it's going to be in person only. Marche asks, my audio is not working. Where can I find the recording of this session and the PowerPoint? Um, so we will be uploading this to our website. Um, tomorrow is a holiday in Bangladesh, so it will take us a couple days to upload these materials, but you will be able to view these um, on our website. Um, Isa asks, can I submit a proposal on women working in the informal economy? Great question. Absolutely, there is... Um, Absolutely, <laughs> is the short answer. I would definitely recommend checking out our white paper because this is another topic that's addressed in that document specifically. Okay, Noor asks, um, when will the We Define RFP launch? Noor, it will be released in exactly two weeks. We will also be having a webinar in two weeks, that is on March 5th at this exact same time um, where you can ask any questions that you like, um, but yes, exactly two weeks and we will have that RFP deadline due two weeks after the WeConnect deadline. Prachi asks, what are the possible dates for this in-person workshop and can people fly in for it or is it reserved only for those in DACA? Great question. Um, so this will take place on April 2nd um, that date is fixed, and certainly you, you're welcome to join us if you're not based in DACA, um, but we're not able to support um, travel expenses or logistics, um, so please just keep that in mind. Um, that's why we're framing it as, you know, really geared towards folks that are already based in DACA. All right, I'm actually at the end of my questions list and we have five more minutes on the clock. Does anyone have any additional questions? Right, you're welcome, everyone. <laughs> oh. 
All right, I see another question from Sarah. Can you recap the Greenfield evaluations? Must they be RCTs? Great question. So Sarah, um, they do not have to be RCTs. We are looking at rigorous um, methods that include, I mean, many of our studies are RCTs, of course, um, but they do not have to be. And we do um, go into quite a bit of detail in our FAQs documents about the types of designs that we consider rigorous. Um, but to recap the Greenfield evaluations, this, um, this funding category is really geared towards funding a large scale quantitative study in its entirety, including um, baseline, midline, endline, for example. That said, we, we do receive many, many proposals to this category, um, but we what we're really looking for in a successful Greenfield proposal is strong proof of concept. So please do um, be prepared to show us that you have done a pilot or you have some other very strong proof of concept to demonstrate and, and really kind of argue for um, a scaled up version of the study that will be a huge boom to your proposal. Betty asks, when will the final decisions be made and funds released? Great question, Betty. Um, we have a specific timeline in our RFP document for reconnect um, with exact dates, um, but in short, we will be making final decisions in July. Uh, we release the first tranche of funds upon um, receipt of a fully executed contract, and we are hoping to have all contracts fully executed by August of this year. So hopefully the first tranche would be released in August. Doris asks, how many teams can a person belong to as a PI and a non-PI? Um, Doris, we have no maximum. Um, you're welcome to apply in, as a part of any number of research teams. Marche asks, can you please type here where I can find the recordings of this session? Yes, perhaps Tess Nuba can um, drop um, a link to our, great. It will, we will upload it in the BIG website. Um, we'll uplo upload that under our resources tab. So perhaps Tess Nuba can drop in the chat the link to that page. Morgan asks, if we are thinking long-term and want to propose a pilot for this funding cycle, are you interested in funding a larger study in the future? How often are these grants offered? Oh, great question, Morgan. Um, I think that is a really great strategy, and that's one that, especially on We Define, we advocate for very directly. If you're in the early stage of a study, we do recommend applying for pilot funds first. Um, absolutely. In terms of longer term, yes, we do look at the pilots in our portfolio as strong candidates for greenfield funding down the line. Um, so I do strongly advocate applying for a pilot um, if, if that's where you are in your stage of research. Regarding the timeline, so we're currently planning on releasing at least one more RFP under the We Connect initiative. And we are planning to offer Greenfield grants under that RFP as well. So in short, yes, I think there's a very clear pipeline um, for studies that are applying as pilots this cycle to be to receive scale up funding in the future. All right. Those are great questions. Thanks so much for everyone's engagement and interest. Um, since we only have one minute left, I will say thank you so much, everyone, for your presence and attention today. Um, it's always so great to interact with everyone. And a big thank you to Imran Bai and Tohi Bai for your presentations as well. As always, we are available on email. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us at our institutional account. You can also email my direct account. I love engaging with you all. And we look forward to continuing to engage with you um, over the next few months. Thanks so much, everyone, and hope you have a great rest of your day, evening, <laughs> depending on where you are.